Yes, sit down. Yes, exactly. <laughs> this is going to be the sexiest growth talk you've ever been to. <laughs> or, <laughs> or a therapy maybe, session. Or a therapy session, exactly. <laughs> um, Hey everyone, um, I'm Tina Sharkey, um, as you heard, and I am a partner at Sherpa Foundry and at Sherpa Capital. Um, but I have the privilege of uh, talking, we said moderating one person is sort of like Zen in the art of moderating, so don't interrupt yourself, okay? I'll try not to. Okay. Um, Julia Hartz. Um, if you don't know Julia, I will tell you that not only is she the co-founder of Eventbrite and the newly minted CEO and board member at Eventbrite, but also a great friend and one of my, the people I most admire out there. Um, so before we get into the whole story of growth, I want to set some context on the Eventbrite story because this is not a new story. Eventbrite is going into their 10th anniversary, a decade. Rock on, awesome. And um, let's hear a little bit about the history of Eventbrite and then we can get into its next decade and the next chapter of growth that you will be driving. Sure, so Eventbrite was founded in 2006 by myself and my co-founder and husband, Kevin Hartz, and our third co-founder, Renaud Visage, who I like to say was the bravest man um, to start a company with uh, two people who were engaged to be married at the time. So this year is a really important year for us because it is our 10th Eventbrite-versary, we call it, and also uh, my 10th wedding anniversary. So it's quite a moment of reflection. And when I think about the early days of Eventbrite, we bootstrapped the company, and so it was um, um, literally a mom and pop shop from the beginning. It was just the three of us for the first two years. And I think um, when, I, when I apply the backdrop of growth to our early story, I think about the fact that we did actually have some nice room to understand what market we were going after. So in the beginning, Eventbrite was created to basically um, democratize ticketing, to uh, give just anybody in the world access to a platform that would allow them to gather people, like we're gathered here today, and sell tickets to events. And actually, there was nothing out there in the way of a self-service model that would allow you to do that at the time. But we didn't know how big that long tail of ticketing would be, so we weren't sure the size of the market. Nobody sizes markets that include yoga classes and cooking workshops and small tech conferences. So we were sort of in this vast land of the unknown in terms of our total addressable market. Thankfully, over the course of the first few years, we were able to realize that we had a huge growth opportunity, and we were able to lean into that. And we were sort of the, the I would say we had a um, sort of uh, advantage in being one of the first fully self-service tech-based ticketing platforms, and we were able to gain traction in what seemed like a very unsexy market, but in aggregate, you know, really accounted for something large. And so those early days were about validating that there actually was an addressable market and building a product that that market would want to use. And then I'd say the middle years in this first decade were about how fast could we scale into those what we call categories, so different types of events. And now we're in this really interesting era where there's still a ton of growth opportunity for Eventbrite, and one of our biggest challenges is focusing on each area of growth at the right time and applying the right amount of investment to that growth while also getting profitable. <laughs> so, so thinking about that, just for the audience's sake, let's have a little bit of the numbers in terms of how many tickets are you selling a year, how many countries are you in, how many people are passing through your... Um, turnstiles, as it were. Sure. So Eventbrite powered 2.1 million events last year around the world in over 180 countries. Um, we, you know, sell, help our organizers sell hundreds of millions of tickets. We have about a half a million active event organizers using the platform now with uh, about four, over 40 million active ticket buyers. And so those numbers, um, again, sound big, but really for us it's about how do we uh, create the most simple, innovative, powerful product for organizers to easily take on something that's quite daunting. I mean, putting something like this on is no small feat. Um, and I would say that for us, it's about how do we make that even easier for our organizers? How do we help them sell more tickets and reach a larger audience? And then for ticket buyers or consumers, 
How do we help people find great live experiences? You know, a lot of Eventbrite's inventory is hyper-local, and it's, it's really interesting experiences that aren't, you know, the um, Superdome uh, Taylor Swift concert. It's more like, how are you going to enrich your life through these great live experiences? And I think it's our responsibility to help people find those events and access them. So would it be fair to say that all growth is not created equally? Um, and when you actually think about growth, now that you're a decade in, 180 countries, millions of sellers, um, billions of dollars of gross sales, I'm sure, um, how would you break that growth down into what is emerging growth, what has become the stable and core growth, and then looking at new markets and figuring out how do you balance focus and growth when you actually are driving something that has such global reach and universal appeal? Yeah, it's interesting, you know, in the, in, um, the first uh, many years of the company, it was sort of like the rising tide raised all boats. So we were a horizontal platform, which in an emerging marketplace is quite unique. You know, usually you go after one category, one geography, and you get it right, and then you apply that playbook. We did the opposite. We were contrarians. We created a horizontal platform that could power any type of event, and we really leaned into that platform growth. And so what's interesting is now that I look forward for the next 10 years, uh, our growth has become much more focused. And one of the ways in which we apply um, focus to that growth is to think about core growth. So our core ticketing growth, we think about emerging growth, which are ways in which we can in extend our platform and our technology into um, different parts of the event. So for example, we have an RFID um, wristband solution that creates a great way for people to enter events when there's tens of thousands of people at an event. Um, we have a mobile box office that allows for venue owners to be able to sell tickets and manage their venue um, through this app. And those types of emerging technologies for us are very important when we think about future growth. And then finally, there are adjacencies. So as we're building this live experiences marketplace at scale, there are adjacent marketplaces that I'm looking at in terms of that future growth. And so I almost think about it, I'm a very visual person, so I almost think about it as a layer cake. You have to keep those layers uh, building and you have to be thinking about everything from the base to the frosting and in between when you think about growth because you, know, you may have short-term milestones and growth goals but if you don't also have those long-term goals, you're going to eventually hit a wall and have to start almost from a, um, a standing still position, which you never want to be in because that wastes time and you, know, you can't leverage your strategy. So what's interesting there is that usually when you think about emerging market growth, we always say like, well, hone your playbook and then think about what markets you're going to go into. But what you're saying is that Eventbrite, because you're a horizontal platform, your core is your emerging markets. All markets, if they yeah. are in the ticketing space, no matter where they are in the world, is thought of as core, mm -hmm. which is very different than a lot of companies who think about their core markets and then they think of emerging markets as non-core or adjacent. Yeah. You feel like there's multiple Eventbrite playbooks? Because we like to think about playbooks as a way to drive rational growth and then look at the layer on top of that to your cake. Maybe that's the cherry, which is irrational but ultimately goes down and becomes part of the core. So how do you differentiate those two types of mentalities when thinking about growth and playbooks? That's a great question. Um, I haven't quite talked about international. I've sort of lumped it all into core, which is it's such an astute point. So we do have the Eventbrite playbook that we've honed over the last five years since we, we have a uh, team presence in seven countries and four continents. And so there are certain uh, geographical areas that are really important to us internationally, and we do apply the Eventbrite playbook. So we sort of um, you know, use time zero, and we think about how we grew in certain categories over time in the US. But we also honor the nuances of that region, because I think it's really important to understand, and we've done, you know, uh, years of research on certain regions that we're really interested in, there are some nuances around live experiences, uh, around commerce, around on online payment processing, um, around you know, uh, customs and culture that we really want to get right. So we honor that. It's not just one size fits all playbook. So there's this core playbook, but then we, we certainly layer in the intricacies of that international market. And it's really important for us to have people on the ground. That's when we know that we're turning that, that country on. For instance, we just put 
put uh, boots on the ground in the Netherlands. And you know that, that signals that we actually know that we have the inventory that we could power, we understand the competitive set, and we have the technology and payments right to be able to go to market. So what's interesting there is that you're basically taking your playbook and you're applying it around the world, and all of that is core. Some is mature core and some is new core. But how do you make that decision to when to put boots on the ground, when you actually just want to say, not only are we growing in this market, but we're going to actually put roots in this market yeah. and go deep? And how do you make those decisions? Well, that really comes back to this idea of rational growth versus irrational growth. Um, I'm a huge proponent of every startup always thinking about growth rationally. And I know that sounds obvious, but I think... Um, I think in the, in the days where you feel pressure to grow really quickly, when you see something, if you, if you have that amazing moment when something has clicked and is working and you just want to pile investment into that, I think it's really important to think about the long term and to have a growth strategy. And that creates a framework for rational growth. And so for us, it's about do we have the right components, so I, I mentioned some of the important components about our international reach, but then also do, can we find the right people and is this going to ultimately become something that's profitable for us. Um, Eventbrite uh, will, you know, thankfully I got to take the helm the year that will actually re reach profitability, which is exciting um, to do that at scale. But, you know, it took a concerted effort. It took us back in 2014 really looking at where we were placing our investments and what we were getting from those investments. And um, I think that that creates this road to rational growth, which we think about whether it be a region or a product or an area of event management that we're thinking about developing um, a solution for, it, we always apply a lens. You know, we go crazy and get creative and think about how we can disrupt and innovate. And then we go back and make sure that we can support that innovation and that we can grow this over the long term. Because I think Eventbrite is a great example of a company that is concertedly built to last. I mean, we, that was one thing we had in our minds back in 2006. So if that's true, often people don't talk about culture in the same conversation when they talk about growth. And given that you grew up at Eventbrite, not only as the president and co-founder, but really were, in my opinion, the soul of the organization and the people part of the organization, which is a critical part of the playbook, how do you think about scaling the culture when you're scaling the business internationally? Because playbooks often include metrics and go-to-markets and methodologies, but they don't often include that cultural nuance, which is really the fundamentals of growing any real brand and business in any capacity. So how do you think of those two together? So I think about it as a triangle, basically. We have our goal of becoming a profitable company that can self-fund its investments. We have, and that took a, a while for us to um, visualize and really wrap our arms around because frankly, profitability isn't the sexiest topic. Um, but as a company, we really took some time to understand what it would mean to be able to hit profitability with a substantial amount of money in the bank and be able to self-fund our investments and what would happen after that. And so that's a key component of this triangle. The second one is innovation. So you have to be able to innovate and um, in a way disrupt yourself, right? I think that uh, world-class companies have a great way of looking at how they could be disrupted and then being the first person to do that. And so that's another core component. And then the third is what you mentioned, which is people. Um, Eventbrite is a people-centric company, whether it be the Brightlings themselves, the people who work at Eventbrite, or our customers, both on the organizer side and the consumer side. So there are a lot of people interests involved here. Eventbrite is a company that's customer-obsessed and also a company where when you work at Eventbrite, you know that the company is going to do the right thing and always think about people first. So these three components basically pull really tight to create a very, um, a very strong and important tension. And I, don't, I, I think that's just an awesome way to operate a company because you have this great framework. And yes, sometimes they're at odds with each other and you have to create that central point that makes sense and motivates everybody, but it's an awesome challenge. And I, I don't think this is even worth doing if it's not, you know, if it's not, well, it's hard. not fun. <laughs> and, and fun. And fun. <laughs> and, you know, speaking of fun, let's talk about, you know, sexy. So, <laughs> yeah. besides the fact that you are 
total badass, a very sexy female yeah. CEO, um, and who's driving a profitability, which your board would probably argue is the sexiest thing that you could probably do. <laughs> how do you think about that in terms of how it impacts the culture, um, how you engage the board in a different conversation? Because you actually have to evolve your board's thinking to move from this place of invest, 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 to actually harvest and grow your own scale because you are creating that momentum and that flywheel within the company. Well, it's interesting. You know, we've been having um, some very interesting conversations at Eventbrite. I think, again, I think it's hitting like this 10-year milestone that allows you to reflect. And what I do know for sure is that what got us here isn't actually going to get us to the next you know, great milestone 10 years down the road. Hopefully we have some amazing milestones in between there. But um, I'm really thoughtful about how we need to change some of the ways in which we operate. And I think it's very important for founders to understand that you should constantly be looking at the truths that you adopt and that you operate on and making sure that they're still relevant to the stage of your company. For us at Eventbrite, I think it's important for, for um, the team to start honing in on where we need to actually invest more and some of the things that we should stop doing. And so for us, I think it's really important to, um, to think about those areas of growth where we know, and for me, it's about the core. Core can be profitable growth. There are going to be emerging areas that are not profitable right away, and that's okay as long as we have a strategy to get to a place where it's paying off or subsidizing or being subsidized by the core. And those are the types of conversations we're having at the board level because, you know, Ventbrite's growing um, strong double-digit growth year over year. We have a great growth rate, and we're also going to hit, obviously hit this great milestone of uh, profitability. But um, I do not want to forsake future growth or market adoption um, just because I want to get to this great place of being profitable. So again, it's this balancing act that is quite nuanced, um, but those are the types of conversations we're having at the board level. Which is great. So now that we think about the audience, you know, everyone came here not only to hear your story, but to actually use Eventbrite and the kind of growth you've had over the decade and this uh, leadership that you're taking on in a new and different way as a playbook for their own uh, growth. So let's talk about, we've heard about all the good things. Let's hear some of the mistakes. And if you had to do it all again, you have the privilege of having had a seat at the table for 10 years, but not the head seat. Now you get to shift and say, okay, I got to watch, I got to engage, and now I get to lead. What mistakes were made and what lessons did you learn from that that the audience can also take away as a great lesson? I think that um, one of the biggest mistakes that companies can make as they scale is what I just mentioned, which is doing things that maybe seem like a great idea and seem like a good use of time and resources, but actually aren't measurable, significant, incremental growth to your strategy. And those are hard things to discern when um, people and emotions are attached to them. And so I actually think that doing a regular audit of um, sort of the way of the world in your company and looking at it from a fresh perspective, however you have to get there, and that's really hard to do to step out of it, but whether it's that you have to go away and physically remove yourself from um, the company or you need to just stand in a room with a bunch of whiteboards and play blank canvas for a day or two or three or five or seven. Um, I think it's really important to take that time as a founder to think about how you would actually build your company from scratch again. So I go through that exercise on a somewhat regular basis, I'm trying to be more regular about it, to really discern those things that maybe we're doing that we shouldn't be doing anymore. And not necessarily because they're a horrible idea or because they're a mistake, but just because we could be yeah, actually uh, applying those resources to something else. Which, which raises a great point. In our last minute, you know, um, the industry is changing, the funding environment is changing. Um, what was rewarded maybe five years ago might not be rewarded today to the startups that are out in the market raising and growing and thinking about that. Um, what are some of your predictions on how to, the perception of growth is going to change and the conversations around not your board table, but board tables across the board is going to change in terms of expectations on growth and scale? Well, I think that um, companies are going to be held accountable for having 
a plan and a long-term plan. I think that many investors and board members are going to want to know that there is a roadmap that they can, these companies can be held accountable for. And I think that's a great thing because while we all want to create the next big thing and you know, we've been in, and you've been you know, involved with some rocket ships, there, um, there comes a time when maybe that is building something that's unsustainable. And I think that if you, know, you think about what you're spending your, maybe your life savings, certainly your most precious resource, your time, and your brain trust on, I think all of us would agree that we want to build something that's sustainable and that creates a real difference in the world. And so at a board level and at an investor level, I think that's what's going to be expected of companies is really being able to sketch out something that is durable as well as exciting and innovative and disruptive. Um, and I just think that's good business overall. I, would you agree with that? Absolutely. And um, sadly, we're running short on time, um, but I know that Julia, in her role as CEO of Eventbrite, as one of the leading women in tech and at the boardroom and at the CEO level. Um, I recommend following her, following Eventbrite, following what they do. And in your own endeavors as founders, as investors, as entrepreneurs, as board members, really bring a new conversation to the table because it is a changing and evolving time. And uh, we're out of that atomization of the web and the mobile web. And now we're into the roots being put down and the companies that are gonna like be sustainable for the long term. So um, let's use Eventbrite as one of the companies that shines that light. Thank and you. And thank you. Yeah, thanks thank so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys.